There are a number of features hidden within ancient Egypt, many areas across the plateau, that one is unlikely to be taught an accurate account of by any tour guide or academic alike. Not only do these features escape modern understanding, but as our argument strengthens in regards to our posit of their having been past yet once highly advanced and thus incredibly capable ancient civilizations having once flourished not only across ancient Egypt, but many other parts of the world as well. One cannot disagree. Ancient Egypt, with its enormous pyramids, and indeed their guardian the Sphinx, are clearly some of, if not the most impressive ancient ruins still in existence on our ancient planet. Yet our next feature of interest could, in all possibility, begin the rewriting of massive chapters of our already claimed as concluded historical human studies of antiquity. We have previously covered the intriguing ruin of yet another sphinx found in Pakistan. However, would one be surprised to hear of a possible doppelganger? Another sphinx? Once of the same scale as our long-claimed sole pyramidal guardian? A sphinx that can actually be found upon the plateau itself? Yet due to the extraordinary age which the sculpture clearly is, along with the possibility that this second sphinx had likely remained submerged within the sands of time throughout Giza's re-inhabitation, one which we claim is academically used to pin the creation of the plateau on a more recent permitted ancestor. According to a Dr. Rita Abdel Halim, who previously published an article titled A Second Sphinx at Giza Plateau, both sphinxes are located on the west bank. The first sphinx is considered as the guardian of the plateau. However, the second sphinx is located in the southern area of the causeway, leading to the pyramid of King Khafra. On the north side of the second sphinx, one can see the tombs of King Khafra's children, and on the south, the tombs of Queen Kentkaus, wife of the King Khafra and mother of King Makernos. Measurement of the second sphinx indicate it was once a near-carbon copy of our long-claimed soul guardian, long academically argued as the one and only great sphinx of Egypt. Both sphinxes have a length of about 73 meters, from front paws to tails. The length of the still surviving front legs of the second sphinx is 15 meters, and the width of the whole body is 19.3 meters when measured on the surface. However, after the hopeful cleaning and subsequent exposure of the area surrounding the second sphinx, the doctor believes that measurements might indeed change. How could we ever be expected to believe such limited views of Earth's history? Views such as that of the mainstream paradigm, which is consistently funded and constantly peddling deliberately ignorant, incredibly biased, conformist selective beliefs, now the cornerstones of many institutions. Our history is for all, and we all deserve the truth. It is a journey of discovery, which we find highly compelling. In our last video, we explored the astonishing discovery recently made upon the Giza Plateau. Hidden in plain sight, another great sphinx. However, this doppelganger of the better-known, long-claimed sole guardian of the Great Pyramids seemingly possesses a greater level of undiluted erosion, indicative of both sculptures' tremendous age. The questions are, however, just how great is their age? How long have the Sphinx, or indeed the Great Pyramids, been here on our planet? Furthermore, the tremendous levels of erosion seen on the pyramids themselves. Not only do the pyramids display a level of erosion indicative of a prehistoric timeline, but they have seen many additional efforts by a number of now lost civilizations, each far more capable in regards to stonework than the modern man, created a number of layers of far less eroded casing stones, each displaying a varying age, this evidence indicative of several attempts at conservation. These factors all but support the following posit, made by a number of researchers all claiming that the Sphinx, and indeed we feel, the pyramids themselves, are in actuality as much as 800,000 years old. The most recent studies were surprisingly presented 
at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeomineralogy held in Sofia. Titled Geological Aspect of the Problem of Dating the Great Egyptian Sphinx Construction, the authors of this paper, mainstream scientist Monica Vacheslav from the Institute of Environmental Geochemistry of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and Alexander G. Parkomenko, Institute of Geography of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, have blown the whistle regarding what we have supported for a number of years. The starting point of these two experts is the paradigm shift, which has been initiated within the, quote, debate, which has been intended to overcome the orthodoxy within Egyptology, referring to the possible remote origins of the Egyptian civilization, and, on the other, physical evidence of water erosion present at the monuments of the Giza Plateau, which, although suspiciously mainstream researchers such as West and Scotch have made over the years, specifically titles the water erosion controversy, which deliberately overlooked that the Sphinx, having once been recorded as having been surrounded by a body of water, namely Anubis Lake, meaning that the enclosure was once designed with the intent of holding water, itself in turn concealing the Sphinx's possible true identity. Instead, focuses on the erosion clearly made by rainfall and ancient water levels, features we indeed claim were later additions. According to Manichev and Parkomenko, quote, The problem of dating the Great Pyramid Sphinx construction is still valid, despite the long-term history of its research. Geological approaches and other scientific methods permits us to answer the question about the relative age of the Sphinx. The conducted visual investigation of the Sphinx allowed the conclusion regarding the important role of water from large bodies which partially flooded the monument, with the formation of wave-cut hollows on its vertical walls. The morphology of these formations has an analogy with similar such hollows, formed by the sea in the coastal zones. Genetic resemblance of the compared erosion forms and the geological structure and petrographic composition of sedimentary rock complexes leads to the conclusion of the existence of long-lived freshwater lakes within various periods of the lower Pleistocene era. These lakes were distributed in the territories adjacent to the Nile. The absolute mark of the upper large erosion hollow of the Sphinx corresponds to the level of water surface which took place in this early Pleistocene age." End quote. A link to the research can be found in the script. It is a vindicating exposure of ours and others' work, one which we find highly compelling. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings, Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. 
Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers, silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old, have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side.